Welcome to Lecture 4. In today's pre-lecture content, we will examine the history and the theory behind the first modern model of the atom. This lecture will be divided into three parts. The first is an explanation of what is spectroscopy, and we'll look at the light emitted by the hydrogen atom as an example. Next, we will examine how the modernization of the model used to describe the atom led to a more complete understanding of the hydrogen spectrum. Finally, we will end with a discussion of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. As was stated in the previous lecture, the failings of classical mechanics to describe several key problems was rooted in the fact that the current model of the atom was not valid. The prevailing model at the time was termed the plum pudding model, imaged on the left, where the atom was composed of a region of positive charge with electrons embedded in it. This model of the atom was very poor at explaining the light that is emitted from atoms and molecules when excited. The interpretation of light emitted from atoms and molecules is called spectroscopy, and it is one of science's major tools to identify and understand the interaction within and between molecules. For instance, when hydrogen gas is put into a sealed tube and a very high voltage is passed or is applied, the gas is excited and light is emitted. If that light is put through a prism, we can see that there are several colors that are present. The analysis of this light is spectroscopy. Empirically, it was discovered that the frequency of light emitted from hydrogen follows a 1 over n squared relationship. This was later generalized so that the complete spectrum emitted by hydrogen can be determined using the Rydberg equation, which is stated as 1 over lambda is equal to the Rydberg constant times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared where the Rydberg constant is 109,677.57 inverse centimeters. Other key points to note is that the speed of light is equal to lambda times nu, and that n2 must be bigger than n1, so that we always have a positive number for 1 over lambda. This Rydberg constant is for hydrogen only. Every atom has a characteristic spectrum, or series of colors, which can be used to identify it. Again, hydrogen looks like this. Neon looks like this, and nitrogen looks like this. If we had an unknown spectrum, we can compare it to known spectra and identify the constituent parts. For instance, this is how astronomers determine the composition of elements in stars. They look at the light given off by the star, break it up into its individual colors, and compare that to the spectra of individual elements. In the Rydberg equation, when n1 is assigned to a specific number, then it is associated with what's called a series. For instance, when n1 is equal to 2, that series is called the Balmer series. For the hydrogen atom, the majority of the light in the Balmer series is in the visible part of the light spectrum. So the lines shown at the bottom of the series correspond to the red, blue, and violet colors that are observed. Now, let's work on two problems to get a sense of how the Rydberg equation works. All right, so let's try one of these problems. Determine the wave number and then the frequency for a transition between n1 is equal to 2 and n2 is equal to 4. So remember, when we're calculating the wave number, which is what we'll start with first, the wave number is simply this value, this 1 over lambda, because wave numbers are in units of inverse centimeters. So 1 over lambda, according to the Rydberg equation, is the Rydberg constant times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. And we always want to have a wave number be a positive number, so that means then that n2 will always be bigger than n1. And that way then this, this subtraction that happens right here, that subtraction ends up always being a positive number. So let's substitute in for what we know for the constants in n1 and n2. The Rydberg constant is 109, 677.57. N1 in this case is 2, so we've got 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 4 squared. If I keep simplifying, what I end up getting in the end is 2.056 times 10 to the 4 inverse centimeters. And so like I said, this value that I've just calculated right here, this is the wave number. And it's typically in units of inverse centimeters. But now if I want to find the frequency, 
what I need to do is I need to convert this value into meters. And why I need to do that is because I'm going to use this equation, the speed of light is equal to lambda nu. And the speed of light, this value c, its units are in meters per second. This value for nu is in inverse seconds, which means that my lambda must be in meters. So all that means is that I'm going to just take this number and I'm going to multiply it by 100 centimeters over 1 meter. And that means in the end I'm going to get 2.056 times 10 to the 6 inverse meters. And again, the way this unit conversion works, the wave number is in inverse centimeters, and so then I could actually re-express this as 2.056 times 10 to the 4 divided by centimeters. And so then my centimeters, when I do this unit conversion, I have centimeters on the bottom in my wave number, I have centimeters on top, so the centimeters cancel out, and I'm left with inverse meters. Now where does that leave me with finding the frequency? Well, I can rearrange my equation down here, and I can say c over lambda is equal to nu, where nu is my frequency. And so now I've got the speed of light c, and I can write this, instead of dividing it by the wavelength, I can just multiply it by the wave number. So I'll write this out a little bit more explicitly. I have c times 1 over lambda is equal to nu. Well, again, c is equal to 2.998 times 10 to the 8. And my 1 over lambda, well, that's just this number. And so I can just take that and stick that directly into there, which means I take this number and stick it right into there. So I multiply by 2.056 times 10 to the 6, and that gives me my frequency. And so in the end, the frequency is going to be equal to 6.165 times 10 to the 14, and that is in inverse seconds. So now let's try the second problem that I have, or that I want to try here. And this problem is simply stated as determine the Balmer series limit. And what I mean by this is, is what is the highest energy photon that's associated with a transition that involves n1 is equal to 2? So what is the, uh, the photon that's related to that? So let's go back to our Rydberg equation. 1 over lambda is equal to the Rydberg constant. 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. And so I'll start subbing in for numbers. Again, we're trying to find the highest energy, and so again, we need to find this wave number 1 over lambda. That's equal to the Rydberg constant 109677.57. And 1 in this case is equal to 2. And since we're trying to find the highest energy photon, that means then that the largest transition that, that anything in um, starting at N1 is equal to 2 the highest transition that can occur is when n2 is equal to infinity. I'm basically going from a transition from the continuum all the way down to n1 is equal to 2. And so because we're going from 1 to, or that we've got this 1 over infinity squared term, that just goes to 0. So this essentially simplifies to 1 over lambda is equal to 109677.57 divided by 4, which is equal to 2.74 times 10 to the 4 inverse centimeters. And again, if I draw a picture that to sort of understand what just will happen right there, if I draw these, these energy levels, I have um, n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, and then as we get higher and higher and higher, then we start to get much, much, much closer together and that these ends go up and up and up, and eventually we get to something, we get to a very, very, very big number. This, is, this number is very big. And so we essentially start to get to the point where we just say that we're at infinity, n is equal to infinity. And because we're in n is equal to 2, this is where we're starting from, we, don't, we can't count the transition going downwards because we're starting from a transition that involves n is equal to 2 and only anything that's bigger, because remember, n2 has to be bigger than n1. 
And since we're saying n1 is equal to 2, then that means the biggest transition that occurs is when we have a very, very, very big number for n2, which ends up being, which we can write simply as just, it's infinitely big. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to relate this, this value in inverse centimeters. <coughs> we're going to relate it to the energy of the, the photon that's associated with this transition. And so recall when we did the photoelectric effect, energy is equal to h nu. And so I'll use the same c is equal to lambda nu so that we can relate e is equal to h nu to lambda where I'm just going to just rearrange, again, solving for nu, or the frequency is just going to be c over lambda. So I'm going to take this value and stick that into there. e is equal to hc over lambda. And so here again, I'm going to have 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, which is the value of Planck's constant. I have the value of the speed of light, which is 2.998 times 10 to the 8. And then again, because I have a 1 over lambda, I can directly plug in this value for inverse centimeters, 2.74 times 10 to the 4. But of course, because this is in inverse centimeters, I have to multiply it by 100 to put it into inverse meters. And so the energy that I'm going to get in the end out of this is 5.45 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so again, this energy is related to this transition right here where we start at n is equal to 2, and that n2 is, it ends up being a very big number to get the largest transition that we can get out of it, meaning we have the highest energy photon that would be associated with that transition.